Uh, you can, if you have Bibles, you can turn to Exodus chapter 24. We're going to just be looking at that chapter, Exodus chapter 24 today. And I want to talk to you about time with God. Time with God. Uh, we all have 24 hours every day, don't we? No more, no less. All of us have the same amount of time. And uh, the important thing is how do we spend the time that God has given us? We can obviously... Uh, waste it, we can be lazy, uh, you know, or we can spend it effectively. We all, need, we all know that we, there are certain things we do need sleep, right? Some of us only need like four hours. Uh, some of you at four hours, you're thinking, I'm, I'm just getting into that deep sleep mode by four hours. Uh, uh, some of you, it's eight, maybe some of you even ten, I don't know. Uh, a, a few months ago, I slept almost nine hours. I couldn't believe. I don't remember the last time I slept nine hours. It's like, how did I do that? <laughs> Usually about four to six, somewhere around six for sure, I'm at least awake. And sometimes I can go back to sleep. Sometimes I might as well just get up. And it usually doesn't matter how tired I am when I went to bed. I'm just four to six hours. I'm up and ready to go pretty well. So, uh, but, but there are things we do with our time. Uh, you know, there's work. There's school, there's certain things that are kind of locked in. We, we've got to do them where they're part of our duties or responsibilities. And, and uh, we have to work because we have to make a living so we can feed our families. And uh, kids, uh, kids have to go to school. Well, some don't, I guess. But gen- generally, your parents make you go to school. They want you to learn so you can grow up and you can get a good job and support them in their old age. And so, so you have to go to school. And... Uh, Some people spend their time watching sports, being involved in sports. Some like to go out in nature and hike and camp and fish and and all that kind of stuff. And that's why uh, some people like to spend some of their time shopping. I can't even imagine why you would like to do that and why that would be fun at all. Uh, But but almost always, the, the busier we get, even doing God's work, the less time that we usually have just to be with Him. Uh, and, and it seems to be that way. And, and I, I want to challenge you. I mean, I, I, generally we as pastors don't like to say these kinds of things because we always need more people to help and work in the church and all of that. And I don't want to give anybody an out say, well, I'm busy enough. I'm not going to do anything, Pastor. But, uh, but, but, but we can't even be over-involved in the sense of trying to do so much for God when we haven't spent any time with God. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I understand the quality versus the quantity argument. And generally speaking, I disagree. Uh, Ultimately, if we are really going to get to know someone deeply, it's going to take spending some time with them, isn't it? It's going to take spending maybe lots of time with them. Now, I know, I know that some of you are busy this week, but I thought about this, and I thought, probably Dutch doesn't have anything else to do today, and this whole week. Right? And so, Dutch, I was wondering, would you, could you spend about 72 hours with me this week just to get to know me better and me to know you better? Do you have 72 hours you could give me? Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You think so? I know so? <laughs> What, what if I offered you like a hundred dollars to spend seventy? Do you think you could do it? I mean, it sounds very appealing. You, you can see, you, you can see, he's thinking about it a little more than he did at first. He was smiling, he was laughing, but it was like I knew he was n- no. He's he's probably got a job and things to do, and and maybe mom and dad have some things for him to do around the house. And probably 72 hours, it's a lot of time, isn't it? And God, God who created us and made us and understands that, He understands we have time constraints. He understands we have certain things we got to do and we must do. But but I'm I'm here to challenge you in this message this morning from Exodus chapter 24 that, that if you don't discipline yourself and discipline your time, somebody and everything else will. And, And I've... I've been doing this long enough as a pastor, knowing one of the key important things I believe as a pastor, as a preacher, a minister of the gospel, is that I need to have time to pray. 
and I need to spend time in prayer if I'm going to effectively. Now, I've preached long enough. I can always speak for 20 or 30 or 40 minutes, and most of you know that, and maybe even be truthful. It may be the Word of God. It may be all that. But if, if you're going to affect people's hearts and lives, you have to have been with God. You can't give somebody something that you don't have. <laughs> you can't present somebody that you haven't been in relationship with and gotten to know deeply. And, and I'm very concerned that in the Christian world, I'm not talking about the world that doesn't claim to know Christ, or what, but in the Christian world, not only among pastors and preachers and teachers, but among the people that, that we, we are more and more getting involved in doing things doing more and more stuff, more and more stuff, and spending less and less time with the one that, first of all, might show us that we don't need to do so much stuff, <laughs> and that he could make per, per more productive the things that we are doing because we've been with him, because he knows exactly what people need. He knows what this church needs. He knows what your family needs. He knows what uh, Kent needs, amen? And uh, he knows what this state and this nation needs. And so uh, I want to challenge you this morning. I want to challenge you to spend time and to think about, from the beginning to the end, about spending time with God. Uh, because He wants you to. Let me, let me, He wants you to spend time with Him. He's not too busy. I said God's not too busy that He would push you away and say, Not now. <laughs> not now, my child. I'm really busy. I got someone more important than you right now. I'll get back to you when I have time. Years, year, years ago, one of the things that, I mean, I, I, the first time I saw it happen, I thought it must be an aberration. But uh, I, I just was astounded by one of our televangelists who always was talking to God. And, and on his program, he was constantly, he'd be talking, then he'd, then he'd stop here and he'd talk to God for a while, then he'd come back. And, and sometimes he would say, Hold on just a minute, God. Hold on, God. Hang on there. And he'd turn and talk to a mere human being. <laughs> I thought, can you, can you imagine if God is really speaking to you and, and you're in a communion with God that, that you would dare to put God on hold? I mean, if God is talking to me, I want to stay right there and listen as long as he's talking. <laughs> Amen. And I don't care about you. Because you're not as important as he is. And if you are important to my life and I need to minister to you, I'll be able to do that much more effectively after I've heard from him. <laughs> Amen. Instead of trying to minister to you first and then say, God, help me. How did it all go wrong? And he's probably saying, well, if you'd come and ask me, I could have given you some direction that could have helped you out. <laughs> now, Ex Exodus chapter 24, you'll, you'll note, I'm, I'm not going to spend time trying to to exegete the exact place mat, places here, but, but some of this, there's some verses here that probably fit uh, in, in the uh, chronological order back around chapter 19. And so it's, you know, how many of you realize your Bible, especially the Old Testament, isn't chronologically in order sometimes. So, uh, but rather than, than spend time trying to divvy that all together in the time we have today, I just simply want to just read, read this chapter and then talk to you a little bit about it. It says, Exodus 24 and the covenant is being confirmed here with Moses and the people of Israel. Then he said to Moses, that is God, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel. You are to worship at a distance, but Moses alone is to approach the Lord. The others must not come near, and the people may not come up with him. When Moses went and told the people all the Lord's words and laws, they responded with one voice, everything the Lord has said we will do. Now, that's a, you need to be careful when you say that, don't you? Because, <laughs> I mean, you know, when you, when you promise the Lord you will obey, you better obey. <laughs> He's expecting that of you. Everything the Lord said we will do. He got up early the next morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain, and set up 12 stone pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he sent young Israelites, Israelite men, and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as fellowship offerings. I want you to thank you all to underline fellowship offerings. They're, they're wanting to, you know, that's part of what we'd call spending time with God, having fellowship with God. We talk about having fellowship with one another. There's no greater fellowship. What a fellowship. 
What a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Amen. No greater fellowship. A fellowship offering to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood and put it in bowls, and the other half he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it to the people. They responded, we will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, This is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all of these words. Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the seventy elders of Israel went up and saw the God of Israel. Under his feet was something like a pavement made of sapphire, clear as the sky itself. But God did not raise his hand against these leaders of the Israelites. They saw God, and they ate and drank. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me in the mountain and stay there. That's a key point. (laughs) Come up to me in the mountain and stay there. The the old King James, I believe, says, and just be there. (laughs) Just be there. The Lord, and stay there. And I will give you, he said, I will give you the tablets of stone, which the law and the commands I've written for their instruction. Then Moses set out with Joshua, his aide, And Moses went up on the mountain of God, and he said to the elders, Wait here for us, that's him and Joshua, until we come back to you. Aaron and Hur are with you, and anyone involved in a dispute can go to them. Now when Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days the cloud covered the mountains, and on the seventh day the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud, and to the Israelites... The glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain. Then Moses entered the cloud as he went up on the mountainside, and he stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. 40 days and 40 nights. Now, my challenge to you today isn't to spend 40 days and 40 nights. (laughs) Forget everything else. We don't have that. But if God was to call you to that, that's what you need to do. Amen. If God was to call you and say, come and stay with me and stay in my presence until I release you, and it was that long, then you need to do that. Amen. Generally speaking, we don't have 40 days and 40 nights, and God understands that. And God speaks to individuals and leaders and, uh, and helps them to, per- to portray the message to the people. But I want you to see, just we're going to kind of look verse by verse a little bit this morning. In verse number one, God said, come up unto the Lord with others and worship from afar off. And he, he called them all to come, the, the people of Israel, the, the 70 elders, Nadab and Abihu and uh, Aaron and some of those that came in Joshua. And, uh, and worship, he said, afar off. I, I want to just say, sometimes today, people are content to worship from afar. They're, they're content to just... Uh, just see a little bit of the glory of the Lord and, uh, and enter into it, but, but they actually, actually sometimes even hold him off. They don't want to get too close, it would seem. Rather than wanting to get as close to him as they possibly could and drawing closer to him than anything else, they, they don't even strive to. Ultimately, the people, of course, they were afraid, and I, you, you might could understand that if you'd have been there. But, uh, you know, when you have Mount Rainier shaking up there, <laughs> you know, and this glory cloud coming down, you might begin thinking, maybe it's not going to erupt or what's going to happen. Maybe we better get out of here. But, uh, but nonetheless, I, I want to challenge you today. Never be satisfied because I believe the God of heaven calls us to come closer. And we are living under a, a new covenant, a much better covenant, which we may talk about at the end if we have time today. But, but God today is he's saying to you, draw near to me, my child. And, and through the blood of Jesus Christ, you see, he had to, he had to sacrifice and, and he had to sprinkle the blood on the people, on the altar there, that the people were, were cleared before God through the blood, amen, and that, 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 that they were, they were not only, uh, that their sins were forgiven and cleansed that they, before they come into his presence, but that also that he would accept them. And let me tell you today, through the blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, amen, we are accepted, amen. And, and God says, I, I want you to come, I want you to understand, not because of who you are, not because of anything that you have done, but simply because of the blood of Jesus and your acceptance of that blood that has cleansed you from your sin, I want you not only to come, but I want you to come boldly into my presence to make your requests known. Hallelujah. 
You see, when Jesus died and the, and the temple was, uh, the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom, it representing that opening into the very holy place of God to come into God's presence for everyone, not just a few people, but for whosoever will, amen, can call upon the name of the Lord and God wants you to come. And so don't be content with worshiping from afar off. In verse number two there, Moses alone shall come near to the Lord. Not the elders, not the people. God did, did then, and he still does, often call his chosen men, a man or women, to come up closer, to give them vision, to give them understanding, a man to give to the people. But I want you to understand today that God wants to give you vision and give you understanding too. While God still, I believe, he has prophets and teachers and preachers and all of those people that he uses and their ministry gifts that he's given to the church, amen, I I believe that sometimes we need to understand we can hear from God too. You can hear from God. You can spend time in the presence of God and let God speak to you. I believe many of the other gifts that God has given, they will become confirmations, amen? If you spent time with God in prayer and you still can't figure it out, you don't know exactly what to do, you don't know if you heard God or you didn't hear God, often then God will have somebody else come along and speak to you, say, well, I think the Lord would just have me say to you, and all of a sudden, click, that's it. I was hearing from God all along, Hallelujah. Generally speaking, I I believe that a word that comes from somebody isn't something that just comes clear out of the blue and it's just like shocked you. It's been something you're already thinking about, you're already pondering, you're already trying to decide, God, what's your will, what's your direction, and that word just confirms you have been hearing from God. That gives you encouragement to know that, yes, I heard from God on this issue, I can hear from God on the next issue. And that God wants me to hear from him. He wants me to come into his presence. He doesn't want me. Yeah, when we're young and we're babies in Christ, we, we depend on others a lot. The more we should grow in the Lord and become more Christ-like and spend more time in his presence, the more we understand when we've heard his word and when we haven't heard his voice. And so that we can know what he's saying to us, amen, and we can order our lives accordingly. That we would become more like Christ in all that we say we do. Well, the general people needed to be cleansed. And, uh, and they, said, they said, we'll do everything, everything according to the, to the word of the law that they heard read, read to them. And uh, they, they made a promise, they made a note to God. May, may I say to you, listen, church, listen very carefully to what I'm saying. We live in a lying society. Now, whether you, whatever side you may fall on, it's not just lying Hillary. Our society as a whole has become a society of lies. <laughs> I mean, I say to you that I don't care how you cut it, I, I can give you at least four biblical lists that list people that will not see the kingdom of God, and every one of those lists is liars. <laughs> it's not a little thing when people lie. It's not a little thing with God. God expects us to be truthful, to speak the truth. Amen. He expects us to keep our, our oaths and our promises that we said we would do and not just easily say them and go on and forget about it. Well, no big deal, no big deal, you know. We need to be very, very careful. Well, verse number nine, it said, Moses and the elders went on up the mountain. God called them up. And uh, how we need to go and see God today. And, and, and you look there and you see that, that, that the, the larger group of men, they, they, they had a a visitation with God. I don't believe they saw God's face when you really read the scripture and put it all together because no man can see his face and live, he says. But they, they, saw, they saw Moses would see later as God's backside as he passed before him. But they saw some part of a vision or an understanding of God and who he was and, and they understood that. And, and we need that. And, and here's what I want to challenge you. How many, of, how many of you here today I'm not saying you've seen God or a vision of God, but, but you know in your heart you've had a real visitation from God in your spirit. Can you raise your hand? I mean, I don't have to try to convince you today that you're saved, that you know Jesus. You know because, because he has spoken to your heart. He's real in your life, amen, and, and you know it beyond a shout of a doubt. Here's what we've got to be careful of, though. We've got to continue to stay close to Jesus because if we don't, it's so easy to drift off. You see, here were a part of these men that saw this incredible vision of God. A part of these men, one of them was a guy named Aaron, who not long thereafter would build a golden calf. (laughs) Another part of those guys was Nadab and Abihu, who not long thereafter would offer unholy incense before God, and fire would come down from God and consume them. 
because they didn't recognize that God is a holy God. And contrary to what a lot is preached and taught and, and thought today in America, even in our churches, that God has not changed. God is still a holy God. Amen. And while there may not come fire down and consume us when we get reckless and think that it's no big deal just to come into his presence with sin and garbage in our life and act like it's no big thing, there will come a day of reckoning. There will come a day of reckoning for every human being. We will give an account, amen, before God. It may not happen here, but it will happen sooner or later. And so we need to understand it. And I pray that when you've been in God's presence, when you've had an experience with God, remember that experience and remember I, I don't know, but I, I can simply just say for myself, the closer I get to the Lord, the more I realize my unworthiness. The closer and the more that I, that I come into His presence, uh, I, the more I realize that, man, no matter how good I may have thought I was doing, I may have thought, Lord, look at me. I've been really good this last week. I've preached a good sermon. Everybody said it was wonderful. And, and you know, and I did this and this and that. And, you know, it, it's not a production thing with Him. <laughs> He's not impressed Number one, I could never produce enough to even merit His grace that saved me. Amen. It's, it's not that. But, but I'm simply saying this. He is so holy and so otherworldly than what we can even think of that when you really draw close to the Lord. And this is what bothers me sometimes with the flippancy of some religious things and revivals that supposedly go on where there's more flippancy and there's more uh, coming into His presence supposedly. And then they go out and they live like the devil. I, I don't know how you come into the presence of a holy God and go out the same. I don't know how you come in the presence of a holy God and go out without realizing that woe is me as Isaiah, even though he was God's prophet, even though he was saying, hmm, somebody else is saying maybe. Testing, there we go, there we go, all right. Remember Isaiah, and when he, when he caught the vision of God high and lifted up and his train filling the temple, and his angels crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. What did Isaiah do? He fell at his feet as dead. He fell on his face. And, and let me just say, people, let me just say, God is a holy God. Amen. And we do have access. Hallelujah. But we must never take God for granted. We must never remember I preached a month or so ago and, and that, you know, God says, you thought I was altogether like you. No, he's not altogether like us. <laughs> he's high and lifted up. Amen. His train fills the temples and his angels are crying, holy, holy, holy. Holy is the Lord God. They have wings. You know, six wings, was it? Six wings? And what do you know? What did they do with two of those wings? They covered their eyes in his presence. Wow. So, be careful. Because like these men who experienced the presence of God, didn't take them too long to go exactly the opposite direction. You would have thought that that would have been so awesome and so impacted them that they would never have done such a thing as build a golden calf or burn unlawful incense before God, but they did. Verse 12, he says, come on up and be there, or stay there, the NIV says. I just want to challenge you to take some time to come into God's presence and to spend time with Him. What I call is that is just being there. Not necessarily coming with your own agenda, I mean, no, we always have something we can pray for and we can ask, and, and he wants us to ask. Now, don't get me wrong. We do need to ask. We do need to make our petitions known. He, he, he wants us, and he desires for us to do that. But I believe he just wants us sometimes just to come just to be there, just to, just to wait in his presence. And, and, and I don't know what your life is and your home life is like, uh, uh, but... But try to find some place that somehow, some way, you can break away from all the craziness and all the noise of the day. And may I say, if you want to go there and be with him, leave your phone behind. Leave your phone behind. I'm amazed. Even, you know, I don't know. Brother White, though, back there, Jim White. 
How, how did we used to do services years ago when we didn't have phones so people could get a hold of us in the middle of church? I mean, there must have been hundreds of people died and we didn't even know it while we were having church or terrible. There's occasional things, but, but you'd think today that, that if people can't get a hold of us 24-7, that the world would come to an end. What would it say to God Almighty if His people who come to church every Sunday would just lay their phones down and pay total attention to Him, amen, and worship Him instead of worrying about what somebody's going to do or text? I know sometimes you got to, maybe going to get a call to work or something. I understand those things. But I'm simply saying we are tethered to those things. And do you know those things that we're tethered to? If you start calculating how much you spend, how much time you spend on those little devices, hello, and don't tell me you don't have time to be with God. Cut out a bunch of your cell phone usage and your whatever it is, the Facebook and everything else, and take some time to call home to be with God. Not Facebook, but face-to-face -face with God. You say, God, why aren't you there? Why don't you? You know, people complain, God doesn't talk to him. Why doesn't God answer? Why? Well, number one, you don't spend enough time to hear him. You know, we think that God has to answer on our timetable. Whenever we speak, God, you're required to answer. Not so. Number one, sometimes I believe God holds off because it's the only way he can get our attention. It's the only way he can get some time with us. When we get desperate enough, then we'll start praying and waiting in his presence. Hello. I don't know about you, but I'm praying God help me, your pastor, uh, not to have to wait for an emergency or an accident or a tragedy to call home. But Lord, I want to be, and I want to change some things in my life right now in the months directly ahead where I spend more time with Him. And I lay aside some things that aren't necessary. They aren't a sin in and of themselves or evil in and of themselves, but when they consume your time and you have no time to be with God, they become a sin unto you. They do. Think about that. So He said, Moses, come on up and just be there. Not asking for something, not demanding something, not doing all the talking. Just be there, basking in God's holy presence. We see in verse 14 that Moses made provision for the people to be taken care of. And uh, it's kind of like that in the New Testament. Remember, that's when the first deacons were appointed because the, the apostle said, we need to be in prayer. <laughs> We need to be seeking the face of God. It's, it's not that these aren't important. And understand, there were important issues. They didn't just, uh, they didn't just uh, appoint deacons for no reason. There were important issues they understood that needed to be taken there. There were legitimate complaints that were being uh, voiced in the church. But they said, we shouldn't be taking our time to do this kind of thing. We need to be in prayer. So why do they need to be in prayer? So they could hear from God. So they'd have a message from God to give to the people. Rather than just a message about God or how awesome He is, that they would have been with God. A Pentecostal preacher, Brother Roy Stewart, means nothing to most of you, probably none of you at all. Came through a, a little town called Obar, New Mexico. That's up, in, up there close to Dalhart, Texas, if you know that area a little bit. A little wide spot in the road back in 1932. And... Uh, and uh, my, my parents, and both from both sides, whose family, we had Methodist and Nazarene backgrounds. But this guy come to the little one-room schoolhouse preaching Pentecost. And my mom and dad were gloriously filled with the Holy Spirit and forever transformed their lives. Just, just uh, made an about face, amen. And from that day forward, uh, they, they were already good people. They are already serving the Lord. But there came a difference in that service unto God and that understanding and that relationship with God that they were able to pass on to their children whose children are now passing it on to the next generation of children. Amen? Thank God. Thank God for that. But it's because they took time. And you see, in those days, we seem to have more time. <laughs> We seem to have more time. But let, let me tell you, we all have 24 hours. Remember I said at the beginning of this message, and it's just up to you what you're going to do with your 24 hours. And may I say to this, no matter how much we gripe, gripe and complain, sometimes there's emergencies, sometimes there's other things. But, but, you know, if you were to take, every one of us were to sit down here and would map out what we've done with our time over the last month, it would pretty much tell what you're mostly interested in. Wouldn't it? I mean, that's the truth of the matter. How you spend your time, in other ways, how you spend your funds. 
You know, one thing says to me that a lot of people aren't interested in the kingdom of God and the advancement of the kingdom of God. Even God's children who sign membership things that say we'll pay our tithes and give to the church, they don't ever do it. They never give to God that which he has blessed them with and the tithe and the offering. And many never give to God in the offering of themselves to his service. Amen. How many know it's not about just saying a prayer so I can get to heaven? God says, I want you to become a disciple. I want you to become a follower of me. Amen. I want you to be willing to lay down your life. I want you to count that even your relationship with your parents or, or your children is not as important as your relationship to me. Hello. Well, I got to hurry on. I'll never get done. The apostles appointed the deacons so they could be in the word and in prayer. Now, how many of you have flown in an airplane? A few of you? Uh, sometimes in, in an airplane or something, you have people have inner ear problems. You kind of get dizzy or fuzzy and, and you could lose direction. Sometimes you get in an airplane, you get up in the cloud and you can't see. How many of you have ever rushed the, the door where the pilots are when you've, when you've been in a flight and suddenly there's cloud and you can't see the ground, you can't see anything? How many of you are out there and pounding on the roof? Do you guys know where you're going? <laughs> how many of you would fly with a pilot that refused to use instruments or didn't know how to use instrumentation to get where he needed to go? You see, there's going to be times in your life, God says, come up into the cloud, because that represents to me also, not just that the glory of the Lord is there at that moment, but you're going to walk through times in your life when it's going to be like you're in a cloud, <laughs> when nothing seems to make sense, when things aren't going right, when you've prayed, when you've done everything you know to do, amen, and it just isn't happening, and you're going to need to de depend upon the Holy Spirit, amen, and the word that God has given you. You're going to need to walk in faith on the word that you receive from God when you're up in the glory cloud, when you're walking in the cloud that that you can't understand which way you're going, which way is home, amen. But trust God, trust the Holy Spirit, amen. Trust the navigate, navigation system that he has given you, amen. And if you've been with him and you've talked with him, then you can do that. Now, Dutch isn't going to know a thing about what I do all this week. That's a crying shame. And I'm not going to know what he's doing all this week except... You know, I know, let me see. Now, Facebook supposedly has all of our stuff recorded if we have the right stuff turned on there. I could probably follow and see where Dutch goes all week. I don't know. The problem is I don't know how to do that stuff anyway. But did you, did you know it doesn't matter how much Facebook, how much whatever we try to do, or how much we try to, you know, bleach our emails out or whatever else, God in heaven knows everything. Amen. And let me just say this morning, He's calling to you. He's calling to you. Moses is in the cloud for six days with nothing happening. And sometimes we feel like that. Lord, I've been here forever, it seems like. When are you going to start talking? When are you going to tell me what you're going to tell me? And uh, uh, we're so impatient. We want God to speak, and we want it now. And we, we never offer that relationship to build. Amen. I mean, often God is, he said, I just want to build relationship. Oh, he could do anything right now. You know, he could, he could answer a prayer. He could take care of it right now. But sometimes it's not, we don't understand. It's not about, it's about relationship. He wants us to get to know him. Because after all, aren't we as disciples supposed to become more Christ-like? How could we become more Christ-like than being in his presence? It's not just observing the other saints. In fact, if you observe the other saints, you might not become more Christ-like sometimes. But when we come into his presence and we spend time with him, and it's there where he changes us, and we talk about when we become a new creation in Christ Jesus, and the Holy Spirit is always willing, the scripture says, to pray, but the flesh is weak. It's there that we begin to understand that he is always there, and he's always wanting to come out. He's always wanting to speak to us. He's wanting to use us, but we don't spend time to understand his voice, amen, and to get to know him to where then, you know what I do? I do what I do because Christ is living in me and through me. Not because I have to, not because the assemblies of God gave me a set of rules to live by, amen? Not because the church denomination gave me a set of rules to live by, but I do what I do, amen? And if I'm not Christ-like, if I'm spending time in the presence of a holy God, how many know my lifestyle will become holy also? Not because I tried to do it in the arm of the flesh, but because it's just who I am. 
I've been with him, amen, and he has changed me, and he's changed my desires. I no longer have to fight, well, God, why do I have, why can't I do that? God, why can't I do this? And God, oh, God, that, that's just not fair. That's not even the question. I'm like, God, why did I ever even want to do those things? Why were they so important to me when, when you are so much better and being with you and knowing your glory is so much more than all this other stuff that the world has to offer? Why did I spend so much time doing those things when I could have been with you? When I could have been hearing your voice all along. God help me to spend that time. Well step on into everything God has for you. God is calling I believe us today to come up to his glory cloud. Amen. I'm going to close with this and ask the musicians if they would come. I want to challenge you today in a moment. I'm going to ask you to come forward too. But I want to challenge you to take time to spend time in God's presence, to get to know God in a deeper way. Did, did you know that a lot of God's children's knowledge about Him is really shallow? Or a lot of our knowledge is head knowledge that's never even gotten into our spirit? You see, when you, when you take the word, and, and remember, this is a saying you've probably heard, you've heard from me dozens of times. You know, somebody said, if you have the word alone, you know, you dry up. Because the Word can be hard to live by if you only have the Word. If you have the Holy Spirit alone by itself, you can blow up. <laughs> but if you put the Word and the Holy Spirit together, you'll grow up. Because the, the Holy Spirit working in you is what makes the Word of God come alive and makes the Word of God doable, not just doable, but you do it because you want to do it because it's who you are. Amen. This world never, no longer holds the fascinations for you that it once held. The things of this world no longer hold the fascination for you that it once held. Only what God wants and God's will and God's desire emanates from your spirit and your being because you've been with the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the mighty God. It takes time to get to really know someone and build relationship. How many know that? It takes time. Here's, here's the thing, even, even among us here as the body of Christ, you realize this, if you only come to Sunday morning and you come, and if, especially if you come late and you leave early, you know a lot of people here, you kind of know about them, but you don't really know them, right? If you're going to really get to know them, you need to enter into more activities with the people of God. You're going to need to come to a prayer meeting on a Wednesday night, for instance. Do some other things. And you're going to take some other time, maybe go out to lunch with or invite somebody to lunch or, you know, do whatever you need to do to get to know one another and build relationship in the body of Christ. God never intended, and I know, I know it's the society we live in, that we live in, you know, we live in miles and miles. Nobody, you know, the majority of Kent Christian Center probably doesn't live right in Kent. <laughs> well, listen, we need to become more and more united together and together we're united around one person that's the Lord Jesus Christ and he says I want you to come home and he said if you're thirsty if you're hungry for more if you're hungry to really know me I'm there for you I'm waiting for you let's stand together as the worship team sings this and just would you just sing it with them this morning